in large part by the insula. The second part that gets strengthened through use, like a muscle gets strengthened with use, the brain gets strengthened, gets built out with use, those parts number two are involved in the control of attention. Those are what are called sometimes the executive centers in the brain in the front. This person here, from your angle, is looking in that direction. Okay? Um, the takeaway point also is given in the slide at the bottom, which hopefully you can see. Basically, normally people lose cortical volume as they age. In other words, they lose brain cells. About 10,000 brain cells die every day due to natural causes. But if you start with 1.1 trillion of them, as we all do, you know, 10,000 a day ain't that big a deal. But by the time a person is 80, they've lost about 3 to 5 percent of the cortical volume. The cortex is the outer surface of the brain. It's the gray matter, so-called, the kind of wiggly stuff you see in pictures. Well, interestingly, so people in the red squares lose cortical volume in those areas of the brain that are circled up in the upper picture over the course of the lifespan. But notice the straight line. people in the blue dots who use their brains routinely to meditate, for example, um, do not lose cortical volume in that area. They do not lose brain cells in that area. They, they, in cortical mass, they build it out over time. That's an example of something good. That actually gets to a larger point. Here's a famous quote from the American psychologist William James, the education of attention would be an education par excellence. It's interesting to think about attention as something you can train, right? We think about training for sport. We think about training, you know, to learn a new language. You can actually train attention itself. It's just another skill, right? And why would it be a training or an education par excellence? Why would it be important? Well, it's because your brain is kind of, or attention rather, is kind of like a combination spotlight and vacuum cleaner. In other words, what it rests upon, it lights up. So you see it really clearly, okay? It also sucks it into your brain because whatever is held in the field of awareness, particularly focal awareness of attention, really, really gets activated. And as those neurons fire together, they wire together. That's the famous saying from the American psychologist uh, Donald Hebb, or Canadian psychologist I said earlier, um, neurons that fire together wire together. All right? Therefore, controlling your attention and getting better skill over your attention is a fundamental way to shape your brain over time, which means changing your life. Now, here's the problem, though. For most people, that spotlight, it's kind of like attention for them is like a spotlight on speed. It's constantly skittering around. They don't have good attentional control. And also, that we live in a culture that's kind of a very scatterbrained sort of culture. One of the preeminent trainings of attention, and one that's been studied the most, is meditation, interestingly. Um, just factually, lots and lots of studies have shown that it actually trains attention and in part by strengthening and thickening, remember, those areas in the front of your brain that control attention. The benefits of attentional training include better sports performance, better musical performance, better academic performance, and greater emotional well-being. All right, so that's an example of how using a positive mental activity routinely can actually change your brain over time. How about a not-so-positive mental activity? How about feeling stressed all the time, and including getting rattled or mad or, you know, worried all the time about something or just cranked up? Um, chronic stress has a lot of bad effects. We evolved to be able to handle acute short-term stress, but long-term, ongoing, day in and out, grind, grind, grind kind of stress eats away in effect at the brain. It actually wears down parts of the brain, and it changes your body over time in bad ways, including, uh, you know, affecting reproductive hormones like testosterone. So the bottom line takeaway point is that your experience matters. It matters not just in the moment for what we feel, for what you feel, what I feel. In other words, every person's experience matters, but also for the lasting residues it leaves behind, stitched into the fabric of the brain and therefore into your very self. This takes me to the third fact about the brain, the bottom line takeaway point, which is incredibly exciting these days. You can use your mind to change your brain to change your mind for the better. In other words, by using the fact that mental activity changes neural structure, once you understand better what's going on inside the black box of your own brain, from your teachers here and other reading and the science keeps making breakthroughs, you'll be able to use your mind to change your brain to change your mind for the better, right, in deliberate ways. I want to give you an example of that. 
It's interesting that as we evolved, you know, and we all have a caveman brain, right, in the 21st century, what are we gonna do with that caveman brain? That caveman brain has what's called a negativity bias. In other words, it really looks for negative events because those pose the greatest threat to survival. In other words, in evolution, it was a lot more important to pay attention to uh, sticks than it was to pay attention to carrots. You know, if you missed a carrot today, you'd have a chance at another carrot tomorrow. You avoid getting whapped by a stick today, you're out of luck. You're not gonna get a crack at a carrot tomorrow. So we have this negativity bias. Bottom line, the brain is like Velcro for negative experiences, but Teflon for positive ones. They tend to slide right through under normal conditions. So what are we gonna do? In other words, the brain is tilted against us. It's tilted for passing on genes, uh, it's tilted, right? But it's tilted against quality of life. So to just level the playing field, we gotta really focus on positive facts and then turn them into positive experiences. So if someone's nice to you or you, you, know, you do well in some way or you recognize some good quality in yourself or you get something done, just getting stuff done going through school, right? Um, that's a positive fact. That's an opportunity for a positive experience, step one. And then step two, extend that experience in time and space. Because the more neurons that fire together, and the longer they fire together, the better they're going to be wiring together. So savor it. Enjoy it. Let yourself feel good for 20, 30 seconds. It's private. No one needs to know that you're feeling good, that you're actually happy inside or having a positive experience. Most positive experiences are kind of mild. You know, on the 0 to 10 scale of positive experience, there are 2 or 3 or even a 1. That's okay. You're still firing those neurons together and getting those neurons to wire together. And then last, sense and intend that the positive experience is sinking deep into you. It's going to implicit memory, which is felt in the body a lot, which is much deeper and fundamental than what's called explicit memory for specific events. What are some of the kinds of good to take in? You can read through the slide. Um, there are a lot of good facts in the world, you know, and a lot of them are right under our nose. We don't even notice them because we're biased in that caveman brain toward the negative, right? Um, one thing is just to the little pleasures of ordinary life, like, you know, having lunch or I don't know if you have the equivalent here of recess or something like that. I'm sure they, they must have that. Um, you know, getting home and being able to watch television, feeling strong inside or recognizing some good quality in yourself. In other words, every day there are a half dozen easy opportunities to take 20, 30 seconds privately, no one knows you're doing it, to soak in good experiences to build inner strength and confidence to deal with life. It's an interesting point here. You know, some people think that taking in the good or really absorbing happiness or becoming a happier person is somehow selfish. Actually, an incredible amount of research shows that the more that people take in good experiences and build resources inside themselves, um, the more able they are to give to others, right? Kind of makes sense. You know, if you only have like a little amount of water in your cup, you don't have a lot to give anybody else. But if you fill your cup up, and even if your cup is, is brimming over, you're much more inclined to feel generous toward other people. You see the quote here from the philosopher, uh, Englishman Bertrand Russell, and, and great scientist and mathematician, um, who said essentially that, you know, basically good people are happy people. Not because um, good people are happy people, but because happy people act like good people. 